Welcome to Leadership and Life Chat with your hosts, me, Becky Ames. And me, Mark Curtis. In each episode, we'll be illustrating how success in leadership is inextricably linked with success in life. Whether it's leadership in business, society, family or friends, we're all leaders. Using our experiences and a range of expert guests, we'll share secrets to boosting your health, wealth and self. So let's get on with the show. This week's episode is all about banana skins. Well, metaphorically speaking anyway. Our guest this week is Janet Pollock, a global coach who specialises in leadership development. These skills were developed during a hugely successful career in the US Marine Corps, and Janet holds a PhD in organisational leadership and development. Janet's book, The Seven Mistakes New Managers Make, How to Avoid Them and Thrive, brings all of these lessons together in an easy to read and highly practical book. So Janet, welcome to the show. Why, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. So Janet, would you like to share with the listeners a little bit more about yourself and your story? Yeah, happy to. So like you said, Mark, uh, I got my underpinnings in leadership in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, Quite frankly, I graduated from college with a degree in education and couldn't find a teaching job. So I said, now what? I looked around and said, how about the military? Uh, Best decision I ever made. Um, That was many years ago. Um, But I really understood what leadership is all about. I really do think the Marines do it probably better than anybody else. Uh, almost in the world, and learned about, you know, what is leadership, and more importantly, that you can really develop it. We take leaders uh, in in the military, you know, individuals that may or may not have a a university degree, and teach them the fundamentals. Uh, In the Marine Corps, there are Uh, 13 leadership traits. And we literally talk about those and develop those throughout an individual's career. I spent time in both the active duty side and then also in the reserve side. Little did I know, and thanks, I guess, to Desert Storm, that um, leadership for women in the military would change fundamentally. When I joined, you know, women were kind of on the sidelines And uh, because of some very, very brave and courageous women, they entered into some of the more combat arms and uh, roles and did a great job. And so from there, I um, got off active duty, spent many years in the reserves, and then worked in uh, human resources and human resources development for the rest of my career. And again, honing what does good leadership look like? Um, what we know is that organizations generally don't invest in their frontline leaders. Uh, they're really great individual contributors and they say, oh, you must be a great leader. I bet you can work through other people and get things done. And so there's a number of studies out that 60% of first time leaders don't feel that they are successful in their first two years, again, because we haven't invested in them. So that's why I wrote the book, uh, The Seven Mistakes New Managers Make, to help them understand, you know, what are the good basic blocking and tackling uh, strategies that you can do as a brand new leader or an experienced leader. Uh, When I first published the book, I did a talk uh, at a client in Minneapolis, and some of them were very, very experienced leaders. And somebody raised their hand and said, Janet, you know what? These are mistakes I make all the time, and I've been leading for 15 years. So they are kind of the basic underpinnings of how do you do good leadership? Well, what what a great what a great <laughs> intro, thank you. And and why what inspired you to write the book? And and as you say, I think you know I've read the book as and I know Becky's had a look through as well. And and there's things coming out which really resonate. You know that that's what I really liked about this book. It was it was practical. It was down to earth. It wasn't full of techno business speak. It was very it was very easy to digest as well. And it made you just think, oh, yeah, I could do better in this area. Or mm-hmm. I recognise things that I had to go through and learn the hard way. And and that was the thing I really liked about this book. And 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 rather than just going through all of the seven things in the book, I thought it would be quite useful maybe to just have a chat around the book um, and yeah. and see what comes out of it Janet if that's okay because there's some great lessons we're gonna we learn from this one I think and and perhaps the first one that I'd like to start with and then we'll we'll let Becky go next we'll take it in turns (laughs) Becky um so so 
it, I think being a new manager or, or maybe even you're starting your own business for the first time um, can, can be very similar. And, and I'd really like to maybe explore your, your mistake number one uh, mm-hmm. in the book, uh, which, is, which is doing instead of leading mm-hmm. um, and, and perhaps explore why that can be such a problem. Yes, absolutely. And I think, Mark, that one and Becky, that's really fundamentally to what a manager is all about or a leader is all about. It's working through other people. And if you think about it as, um, you know, this transition from uh, I do everything all by myself to I do things through other people. So I spend time in my workshops talking, for example, about delegation. And of course, there's a hundred reasons why we don't delegate. I can do it faster myself. I can do it, have it done exactly the way I want it to do, to be done. I can, um, you know, I've done this a hundred times. I can do it faster. And yet if we keep that orientation, that sense of I can do it myself better, we never develop the capabilities of our team. What we learned in the last year, particularly with the great resignation, is that people were feeling unengaged at work. They weren't be giving, being given the good and interesting work. They were giving, being given the dregs, you know, and the manager held it on to everything and took all the glory. So I think as a leader, one of the most critical things is how do you leverage the skills and capabilities of everybody else? I think along with that, this idea of delegation is not to delegate just to your most capable person because that most capable person then gets dumped on over and over and over again. And then the others kind of like, well, what am I, you know, they'll, I'll raise my hand when it's time. I always get overlooked. And so how do I get that person? um, How do I get engaged um, in some engage, some of the more junior people or some of the less, ones that come to top of mind because you never know what people are capable of can you do you until you give them a chance really and you've got to it's your duty as a leader to bring people along and develop them and make the team the best it can be absolutely becky well said yeah and and a couple of really interesting things which came out there janet which i i'd I'd perhaps just like to pick up on i think that there's as you say that, that the first bit about the delegating is it's about giving people opportunity. Um, and, and as Becky said there, so, so that's really important. You know, we, we, we want to do it. But if we don't do it, it becomes very much self-limiting, doesn't it? You know, we've, we've, we've all got 24 hours in a day max and we do need to sleep at some points in time. And if we just keep doing stuff all the while, we, we just hit capacity. And, and eventually, if we're not careful, it can not only stop us growing, but it can stop us progressing in our leadership because we need time to invest into other areas as well, I think. We do need time to invest in other things. And if we're always holding on to everything, we just start get exhausted. Yeah. And and if you've got if you've got a real growth mindset and you're interested in in leadership, um, it can become a little bit stale as well. Because if you just keep doing the same things over and over again, maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm expressing my own views on this and how I feel. <laughs> if you know, it, it's just it's just that kind of curiosity to learn and do different stuff and i think we might pick this up on another point in your seven as well but it but it's just giving yourself that room to to kind of expand yourself as well you really are absolutely mark someone once said to me you have to give up the things that you love that are in your comfort zone perhaps to be able to allow others to progress and then you'll find the next thing that you love you know anyway but if you don't do that if you don't give it up first you're not giving yourself the time to do it are you so it's important yes. to not just stick to what we know um, because that's our safety blanket um, and just give others that chance, mm. really. Becky, I think that's such a great point that you make about when someone is promoted to a leader, whether it's you know a frontline supervisor or even an executive, they're often promote they're usually promoted because of what they did really well in their last role. And those are the things we're very good at and like you said, Becky, very comfortable with. So those are the things now that we have to give up on and take on new kinds of leadership responsibilities about, you know, delivering on the whole plan. Um, getting, making sure that everybody is connected and engaged and finding meaning in their work. And so if we go back to the things that we love and adore over and over again, we're going to get stuck very easily uh, in that new role. I was just going to say, I think Janet, what we were talking about there, it very much feeds into um, the the, the third point, your third chapter in the book, which is about developing the team. Um, Because 
delegation is clearly part of of that development but but i mean maybe it's worth at this point expanding into the developing of the team as well because i think delegation is is a a part of that isn't it yes absolutely mark what we know from research is that people learn the most when they're developing right in their role so oftentimes as a supervisor we say oh i'll just send them down to the street down the street to a conference or a workshop or a day long session or here's a video that you can watch but what is most impactful for developing our team members is giving them new tasks to do right in their role so they can apply what they're learning. Of course, having said that, there's a lot in the chapter about how do you do that really well. You give them a model. You um, show them how to do that. You check in regularly with them when they're learning something new. Um, I do a fun exercise in my workshops where I give two different teams, two sets of teams a task to teach the other ones how to do a task. And um, simply all they're doing is creating a, a drawing with a house on it. And so one actually has a picture and says, here, go teach them how to do this. The other one has step-by-step instructions. Well, the step-by-step instructions take uh, twice as long to do it. They generally end up with a picture that looks exactly like it's supposed to, rather than somebody explaining, here's this picture, now go draw it. Um, And yet, what we learn from is that both pieces are needed. You need a video, a visual model. You need some step by, step by step directions. You need the ability to ask questions. You know, I'm I'm this far, boss. I'm kind of stuck on this. Where did the data come from? And my numbers don't quite add up. So developing someone in role does take a lot of interaction. But when you do that well, they have a new skill and they're able to move on and do it on a repeated basis. I think we see that a lot in our business, don't we, Mark, in terms of our trainees. Um, So Mm. we train a lot of of people, Janet, in our business um, in accountancy and tax qualifications and other things. And and it's very much about they they learn the theory, then they apply it in the workplace, but there's a lot of sitting with them and going through it and um, a lot of time invested but they, it brings it to life, doesn't it? And it allows them the opportunity to do it. It also allows, you have to allow the opportunity to fail and get it wrong, don't you? Um, and empower people to give it a go, I think. And it's very much recognising as well, isn't it, that different people um, interpret and learn in different ways. So so I think as, you know, certainly one of the things that I've picked up more and more as I've gone through my career is that actually there's no one way to do it. There's no one way to develop your team because the team kind of implies that it's a kind of a a ubiquitous blob of people whereas they're individuals some people are more visual some people are more audible some people are kinesthetic you know you've got all these different learning preferences and and you have to be really adaptive in your leadership around how you interact with each individual to get the best best out of them when you develop as well and um and and I think you even see that in your personal relationships with your friends and your family some some you know sometimes you can describe something to somebody and you think it's really obvious and really clear but but then they're kind of they're not getting it and it's not because it's it's actually your problem not their problem which is yeah. you know it, it's frustrating at times and you think oh why don't you just get it but it's because you're not you, you're not articulating in a way which resonates with them so that that's been a really interesting point for me as part of my leadership journey which is to be tolerant of others but also to recognize that I need to adapt my style as well to to fit with them yes mark you're so right i've worked with a lot of teams we spend time off site, we develop a mission, a purpose statement, we talk about the objectives for the next six or nine months, everybody gets clear who's going to be doing what, and then two new p- team members join the team. And we as leaders don't often pause to say, okay, now we've got to reconstitute the team. We've got some new individuals on the team that may have other skills that we were not aware of. How do they automatically understand what the purpose and the outcomes of the team are unless we pause and get them oriented as well? And so I think team development, making sure everybody knows what they're responsible for and how do they comp- um, how do they contribute to the overall purpose of the team is an ongoing um project is an ongoing task for the leader of the team, whether, again, they're a vice president 
or maybe a frontline supervisor. And, and uh, I mean, this is going on a bit of a tangent here, Janet, but I was uh, I, I saw a video last week and it was called Super Chickens. Um, and, and I think it was I think it was in a U.S. university. <laughs> You've probably seen it um, where, where they where they were trying to breed chickens, which produced the highest amount of eggs. Um, yes. And I think the very short version of the long story is that they found that what the key trait, which the, the key trait of the high yield egg layers was that they were dominant and aggressive. So they, they were breeding off this chicken and they ended up with a coop full of very aggressive, dominant chickens. And unsurprisingly, the chicken the, the egg production went down um, because they were there was too much infighting in the flock. Whereas the the other sample was just left to its natural devices to you know evolution to breed as they saw in that in that coop, and their egg production was one hundred and sixty percent higher. And they they were translating that across to business, saying actually very often in business when we're trying to develop teams, we 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 kind of selective breed if you like for the best traits, and we get everyone towards the top of the organisation, and then rather than rowing in the same direction they're fighting against each other because it's about personal achievement rather than corporate goals um yes and i thought that was quite an interesting little example of nature if you like how it works and and you know we, we are we are animals to some extent obviously um and i just thought that was really interesting and 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 i suppose it then got me thinking about this podcast today and and your your um your sort of distinguished service in the military you know, you've got a lot of people in the military who are very high performing, high functioning individuals, mm -hmm. but it's almost life or death if they don't operate as a team. So how did that, how did you see that in the military and then how does that map yeah. across into business? So the world's longest question I've just asked there. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a real nugget, Mark, in the middle of there, which is how do you get everybody to accomplish the mission whether they are completely aware of it or not. And when I work with um, people on team purpose, we add um, a phrase that I learned in the Marine Corps called in order to, or what you might say in the UK, so that dot, dot, dot. So we are doing, you know, X number of phone calls in our customer service area um, because our customers have, have paid for this service. But the longer term impact is so that we retain employ, uh, customers or so that we teach our customers how to do something so that they don't call again, <laughs> right? We deal with unique <laughs> yeah. issues in our customer service group, not the recurring ones. And I think sometimes we forget the in order to part of explaining the purpose um, of, of our team. And what I invite uh, team leaders to do is get their employees to describe the in order to. So what is the resulting uh, purpose of that? Uh, in the Marine Corps, we have something called a five paragraph order, which is here's what your team, your, your group, your platoon, your whatever is going to be doing. And we explain in order to, and Mark, back to your life and death mission, if I'm, for example, give, been given the order to take this hill, and I don't know what the purpose of taking the hill is, and I get to the hill and it's completely armed and it's impenetrable by the enemy, I maybe can go around the hill because I'm setting up an external perimeter, for example, uh, for the next wave of, of troops that are coming in. So that in order to, which describes what the next set of objectives is going to be or what the larger purpose is. I think it really helps ground people in why are we doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, mm. I think I think yeah. that you just summed up there at the end, Janet, what we often say is what's the why? Um, and yes. if, you, if you can engage people on the why, then you really get buy-in, don't you? And they understand, mm -hmm. you know, they're, re they're kind of far more on board with something than if they're just told this is what we need to do. Um, and we, yeah, we often say, what's the why? So very yeah. similar. Definitely. So important. I, I, I love that in order to i think that's softer language isn't it like yeah I, it is, um, though, I the, it. why is a bit why can be a bit like why you no know, well it could be a whiny <laughs> child can it a why why have i got to do this or it could be why are you doing this you know, it could be an whereas i think in order to 
sounds more adult, mature, and uh, I just like that language actually. So, so that's yeah. I've I've made a note of that, Janet. Thank you. I, instead of okay. using why, I'm going to start using in order to. It, it sounds it's more of an enabler, isn't it? It sounds a much better choice of language. I like it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, if nothing else comes out today, I've got one big takeaway. Thank you. <laughs> Does that mean you're going to stop asking why all the time? <laughs> I think it also lets lets the receiver of the in order to with how am I going to do that in order to rather than here's the objective you're doing it because I said so um, mm -hmm. it allows them I think a little bit more flexibility about how am I going to get this done in a way that makes sense to getting it done for me um, you know rather than giving the person step by step by step directions the end state is x in order to do y and now i'm left with executing that task the way that i see fit and so i think it's also more yeah, empowering definitely yeah and and i can, can we now make an i can use another segue into another one of your points here Janet, if that's okay yeah. um because, because i think we were talking about the sort of the why you know that the in order to and 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 i think that just really starts to morph into doing things differently you know why are we doing this or in order to we're doing something with a view to making a difference and and I, and i've just this was the bit i loved in your book it was the it was the ucla um study i think where they said that mm -hmm. the average 5 year old in a day um they they do 98 creative tasks in a day um they laugh 113 times and they ask 65 questions Compare that to an average 44-year-old who does two creative things a day, um, laughs 11 times and asks six questions. And, and we wonder why things don't change uh, when we've got maybe more mature leaders in an organization. So you know, doing it differently, dot, dot, dot. Over to you on that one, Janet. Yeah. So in the book, I offer a number of ways of doing it differently. I think one of the challenges that we face when we say, okay, we have to fix our process or how are we going to get more customers? We get everybody in a room and we say, okay, we're going to brainstorm. Well, what I offer up is somewhere around 15 or 18 or 20 suggestions about how do you do brainstorming a little bit differently? And my most favorite technique is um, called make it worse. So make it worse starts with, let's say we're going to, our goal is to add 20% more customers by the 1st of June. Pretty straightforward. We can get in a room and say, okay, how are we going to get 20 more customers? Or you can use a technique called make it worse, which is, so how would we make that worse? What would we do? Oh, we'd stop answering the telephone or we'd answer the question wrong or we'd be rude to the customer on the phone and say, boy, that's a stupid question. And I love this technique because it and I could see it on both of your faces that it makes us laugh. And it's a fun loving way to say, OK, we have a real business objective of 20 percent more customers. And then what the techniques is, is so after we come up with all those make it works, then we go line by line. We say, now being rude to customers, how do we make that better? How do we, well, we have a cheer talk at the beginning of the session, or we share recognition before we get on the phone each day. That would put people in a better mood than, gosh, at the end of the day, you did these three things wrong. So it's an amazing technique. I worked with a group that was actually in Singapore. They used make it worse technique and they found um, savings of over a million dollars in their solutions when they talked about how to make it better. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I love that because, it? It's, yeah. It's huge, isn't it? I mean, as you say, it really, it, it, it was making us smile because I think we were probably all thinking about meetings where we could do that in. Um, but, but it's, yeah, it's just that it's a bit of fun and it, and it makes it more creative, doesn't it? I think when, when, when you try and say to people, how should we do it better? That people are like, I don't know, because we, we only know how we do it now. And to try and think of it in a different way is really difficult for a lot of people, isn't it? Where yeah. this almost takes the pressure off. It feels like it makes it, far less pressurized as well it kind of takes it back a stage doesn't it so then you've got a wider view of what it could look like i guess 
I'm thinking about in that scenario how I'd be thinking and it's almost yeah you've scrapped everything so what should we do instead exactly I worked on a um, team one of the pharmaceuticals in in China and um, we used make it worse because they were struggling with recruiting they you know like so many organizations and especially that frontline employee was hard to recruit and getting the right kind of background and education and commitment and there was lots of competition and one of their solutions was to provide um a recruiting bonus for people that didn't even work for the organization so if i was able to recommend Mark because I thought you were qualified. I'm not necessarily qualified and I already have a job I really love, but I could refer Mark. I actually, not even being an employee of that organization, could get a bonus. Like it was a hundred bucks or something, you know, that was a reasonable mm-hmm. amount, but not insurmountable. And um, they discovered that their recruitment went up about 5% just from that simple program. That's really different, isn't it? We're really yeah. good at asking our people, but we don't think outside. <laughs> yeah, right. we need to make a note of right. that one, Becky. I mean, re- yes. recruitment agents charge a fortune so that we could be onto yeah, a winner here, Becky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> so, so Janet, yeah. do, do you, have you found in organizations, so, so for me, when, when we talk about sort of doing things differently and, and thinking about sort of people sticking with the status quo, I, I probably have two things that come into my head. One is, um, one is the people have almost kind of reached a point in their careers where they don't want to do things differently. Um, so they become uh-huh. blockages on the organization. That's one thought I have. The the other thought I have is um, that the culture is wrong in the business and there's almost a culture uh-huh. of fear and people are frightened to uh-huh. do things differently. Uh-huh. Now, I'm sure there's a load others. So I'd be really interested to hear sort of your experiences, what you found, what, what are the key yeah. ones and how people have maybe changed that as well. Yes. I think one thing I talk about throughout the book is the value of one-on-one meetings. And when I introduce the idea of one-on-ones in the leadership development session, people say, well, I have them all the time. I talk to my people all the time about what they're working on. And really solid one-on-ones go beyond, what have you done for me today? Because that's really a task meeting. You know, how are you doing on X project and what's getting in the way? To how are you doing? Becky, how are you really doing with, you know, your workload, with the kids at home, with managing, you know, this new merger and acquisition that we're going through? And then talking about, so what are you working on and what are you learning? So it turns the conversation from what have you done for me lately to how are you doing as a person and what is making you thrive? So Mark, to, back to your intro to this question around what if I have somebody who's just really stuck in what they're doing and they like doing it and they don't want to change? Maybe there's an opportunity to teach what they know to others. They still do what they like to do, but there's another element of them sharing and teaching that might get them more excited mm-hmm. about what they're doing on. So I think Um, having high quality one-on-one conversations Mm -hmm. is a great way to really tap into what makes each person tick. What do they, how do they thrive at work? And then how can I give them more of that or support what really makes them tick to help um, create a team that's really being successful as well? Mm. Yeah. Asking the right questions is so important, isn't it? And then listening as well, rather than just simply mm-hmm. talking at them all the time mm-hmm. and just saying, well, tick, tick. We did a one to one, done that. It's uh, yeah. it's really investing time in understanding that person and their motivations. We've done quite a lot, Mark, haven't we, with with teams, with motivations and understanding how fulfilled they are in those as well. And, and you only find that mm. out when you are one to one with them. Um, and it's mm-hmm. so important, like you say, to find out what makes people thrive. It really is. The guideline is in a good one-on-one, you as the leader are only talking about 30, maybe 40% of the time. So back to your point, you're listening, 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 and it's really a time for your employee to share what they're thinking, what they're working on, what would help their work life be even more successful. You know, I bet if we said that to some of our people, they'd be shocked. (laughs) 
because they just use those one to ones to talk at people. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I think that would be quite an interesting stat to say. You know, a third yeah. of the time should be you. The other two thirds should be them. Know that if you were to implement that, it wouldn't happen immediately. Because, Becky, as you're pointing out, if you, you know, one of these tell, tell, tell meetings and suddenly you said, this is your time, tell me how you're doing. Well, nobody's ever asked me that. I don't know what to say. So I think you'd come to this 33%, and I love your idea of a third of the time. It would take a while. You know, it might take two or three meetings to kind of get to that point. Which comes back to Mark's point about the culture, isn't it? If that's not how it's always been done, then you've got to get there gradually. You can't just Mm -hmm. flip it overnight and expect people to open up to you and suddenly share when before they've just never been asked. But I I think that's that's such a powerful thing that um, I love that. The power of listening. We talk about that a lot, don't we? And and asking the right questions. Mm. So really important. And, and Janet, I think I think I've spotted another segue here. Th- th- anyone would think this was scripted. Um, so, so we talked. You were talking about one-to-one meetings there, and um, so, so one of the other um, big mistakes is around feedback um, and having really good quality feedback. And again, to quote something out of your book, it was sixty-nine uh, percent um, of um, employees on a study said that they would work harder and feel more engaged if they had proper feedback. You know, and that's, that's staggering, isn't it? Because it's such a you know, it's such an easy thing to do to give feedback to people and have those conversations. Yet that kind of statistic, 69% of people would feel more engaged and empowered if they did, suggests that it's just not commonplace to get good quality feedback or any feedback. Yeah, right. They, I think people worry that they're going to make the relationship worse than better. Uh, and so they, they suspend their idea of giving feedback. Good feedback is is very straightforward. Uh, First of all, it's forward looking rather than looking back because who wants to plow over that old ground because you get into this, well, I was thinking and you did and I should have done and all those kind of things. So first of all, good feedback is specific. Um, It describes the impact, what happened because of the behavior, why did the behavior matter? And then what are you going to do differently next time? How are we going to move forward? And it's amazing to me when I check in with the the leadership groups that I work with, that um, when they actually try this, that they, um, it really makes a difference because it focuses on what could we do differently next time rather than laying blame Mm -hmm. anywhere. And what I point out in the book is this also works for giving recognition. So um, the other statistic is that people feel very much under um, under recognized for the work that they do. When I look at employee engagement surveys, one of the lowest ones always is, am I, am I recognized for a job well done? And the same thing can happen. We can use that same framework. Uh, what specifically did the person do? What was the impact? And then uh, we the third question, we switched just a little bit to what did you learn? What did you learn from the process of doing that so well? Uh, I would love to offer to any of your listeners a free feedback session. Um, you know, these te- techniques are really easy to do. And we get on a Zoom call just like we are today and talk through how do you give effective feedback and effective recognition. And so people need to just reach out to me and I'd be happy to do that for free with your team. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure um, producer Lizzie has a link in the show notes for that one. So thank you for that, Janet. As you were talking there, this stuff was really resonating. So so, um, one of the things, part of what I do in my role, uh, I I did a qualification in motivational maps, which was is all around nine key motivators, and and it's a scoring system for people. And there's been something like twenty five thousand of these maps conducted for for people globally. And one of the key ones which come out is one which is called Searcher. And Searcher is all around making a difference and having uh, meaning to what you do. And as I say, it sits in the top three of 80% of people who've ever done a map. So, you know, if, if, if you if you just take that one and think, well, you know, eight out of 10 of my employees making a difference and having meaning to what they do is really important to them. Not giving feedback and having structured feedback is like the worst thing you could do for those people because 
that a they don't know what success looks like and what meaning looks like and b they don't know if they're actually succeeding in it or not and making a difference so so it's such an easy win isn't it you know and uh as it's you say it's it's perhaps more down to the confidence of the employee of, of the of the leaders on this and yeah that, that people should just do it definitely yeah I'm I'm thinking back, um, Mark, to when I worked on my dissertation. I looked at the experience of college graduates during their first year of employment, and it was a qualitative study. And one of the resonating uh, themes that came up is, I don't get feedback for the job I do. And uh, these were college graduates. These were 22, 23-year-olds. And I said to one of them, So tell me more about that. Why does that matter? And one said, well, first of all, I have a boss who said, if you don't hear from me, assume everything is fine. So this this is a company that generally hired straight A students. You know, they got really the cream of the crop uh, in their hires. And imagine someone saying to a brand new hire, like, if you don't hear from me, everything is fine. But what they explained to me is in college, They got feedback all the time, whether it was an exam, a paper that they turned in, you know, the average university student takes four or five classes at a time. So they are getting feedback every single week, every other week. And then they come to a workplace and they get feedback once a year. It is such a change. And I think even those who have of us who have been out of university for many years still have that orientation of getting regular feedback because that's what we did for, you know, 10, 12 years of our lives. And if we keep that in mind and then have a good way to give someone feedback, both constructive feedback and recognition, it really makes a difference in the quality of the way we interact with each other. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, bizarre, it's very isn't true, it? isn't it? That you, when you're in education mm. of any type, you do get constant feedback. And I hadn't thought of it like that, that when you're transitioning particularly, that must be such an adjustment if you're not getting it. And to say, if you don't hear from me, everything's fine, is is lazy, mm. really, isn't it, on the part of the manager? It really leader. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, was just, I was just imagining, if, if you used your, your sat-nav in your car and you plugged in the destination and it didn't speak to you, you, you would get, you get quite worried, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just assume you're on the right road, you're taking the right turn. You, you want the sat nav to say, turn right, turn left, roundabout ahead or whatever, it, third exit. You, you know, you, you're getting constant feedback from your sat nav. Um, so, so, you know, we're on a destination, a journey in our business and we're the sat nav, if you like, and we're not giving, we're not talking to our teams. We're not giving them any direction or guidance. Uh-huh. You know, it's it's kind of if you put it in that that kind of perspective, it, it sounds sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does sound crazy. So I can segue that into another point, Mark, <laughs> where, uh, where Janet was. <laughs> one, her point two is about if you don't have a plan, then you're not going to get the execution, basically. And for me, that is you know one of one of the most powerful points is that the team do need the vision, don't they? And they need the feedback that they're on target and they're progressing in the right way, obviously, which is my seamless segue. Uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, with, without that vision, without that idea of where they're going and it comes back to what's the why in my uh, the language that we've always used or in order to, as we're now going to say, if you haven't got that plan, Janet, there's, and you haven't communicated it well. And I think that's probably the key point, isn't it, about sharing that vision and, and really taking the team on the journey with you. I think it's so true. We we often think as leaders, well, the company has a mission and the company has a vision and my team is just supporting that. But uh, good leaders, effective leaders take time to really describe, so what's the purpose of this team and how does it lead connect into that overall mission? If you're in customer service, for example, uh, is your purpose really to not lose customers Is it to get people, your customers, to write you good reviews on the various um, chat sites? Is it to buy more stuff? Um, A a team that's in customer service, given what those individual different purposes are, would be interacting very differently. And so taking time to describe what is our team's purpose and how does that connect to the overall mission of the organization? I think so often we think, well, duh, I think everybody gets that, but they don't. They don't. And taking no. time to do that um, brings out that that personal connection. Yeah, 
definitely. It sort of it helps people understand their place in the organisation, doesn't it? And what they're contributing, what they're bringing to the table, and and also what success will look like. Which comes back around to the feedback point again in terms of um, you can't hold someone to account if you haven't told them what it is that you actually would like them to be doing and why you want them to be doing it. Yeah, and uh, and I think in, in in that point in your book, Janet, you um, you very much gave the example of Eisenhower. Um, in the UK, we like to say it was Churchill who came out with it, but maybe they both did. I don't <laughs> okay, know. Fair but but very basic <laughs> pa- 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 paraphrasing it very badly, you know, it's kind of um, pl- planning is important, but plans are a waste of time. You know, you've got to be adaptive, mm-hmm. so you, you might have that vision and you know what you're going to achieve. Um, and and I think they were very much talking around the the battlefield in the Second World War, weren't they? Which is, you know, you can have this plan, but when you get there things are going to be a bit different to what we thought when we were planning it and you need to have people on the ground who can think on their feet and they can execute in the moment in the frame of the plan but still be adaptive as well Mm. Um, and and I think that's kind of something which we talk about with our teams a lot which is this stuff is not set in stone a plan is just a plan it's not one of the you know 10 commandments it is just a plan and and if you see something isn't quite right or the environment has changed then we want people to feel empowered to think for themselves and challenge that plan um so so it, so it still remains relevant even if the circumstances are changing around it yes absolutely but if they don't understand what the vision is then they can't help yeah. hope to even influence the plan can they so it yeah mm-hmm. definitely it's so important that they understand what the what the purpose is and what the end goal is yeah and i think it was um aristotle who said something like a a life without a plan is a life not worth living or something like that as well you know so so even going back two and a half thousand years we've understood the importance (laughs) of a plan (laughs) mark i love how you point out that it's not set in stone it's carved on on paper it's carved in word you know and we can change that very easily if that makes sense but that plan does give us some direction and gets us on the same page about here's what we're trying to accomplish so so i'm now going to segue into the next point from this which is we can have all the plans in the world we can delegate um we can empower the teams but as a leader we've got to we've got to be influential we've got to have influence as well because otherwise it's very difficult to make the other stuff happen so so that leads nicely into um, your mistake number five which is not developing your power yes yeah so we think about um power and power and influence are very similar concepts Uh, i think the key in successful influencing because we don't think about this is what matters to that other person? So I may um, try to get either Mark, you or Becky to do something uh, to support my program, you know, to give up one of your head counts so that I can do something more. And yet what matters to Becky may be very different than what matters to Mark. And so my influence, my ability to influence each of you will be dependent on what matters to each of you. And I think when we think about influencing, we don't take that step to say, what really matters to Becky? What will get her across the finish line in terms of supporting my idea? And the way we do that is spend time with Becky beforehand, before we need to actually influence her, build relationships, understand what her group is responsible for. How do I support the work that she's doing so that when it turns around and I need to ask her for something, we've already developed that relationship. Yeah, that is so powerful. And I mean, we see that so much with our clients, with our teams in terms of if you haven't got that relationship, then you can't hope hope to influence in any way, can you? Um, you know, you just you can't then you're just telling and that's that's not that's mm-hmm. not the best use of, of your power at all. And it's certainly not how we want to be as leaders. Um, but, yeah, the, if you've got the relationship, then and it works both ways, doesn't it? That's not manipulating or anything like that. That's mm-hmm. not how it's meant, is it? I think it's about making sure that you've got a good basis on which to move forward together because you've built that relationship over time. So, Becky, there's only one point left in the book we haven't covered so yeah, number seven, Mark, not getting ahead of change. Is that where you want us to, to go? <laughs> Have I yeah, got that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah, because we've done all this stuff about all the things you can do, but... <laughs> yeah, you've got to get ahead of change, haven't you? And I think, Janet, uh, this is another, I mean, they're all great, but this is such a key one, isn't it? That as leaders, we've got to always be looking ahead and anticipating what might come 
And it goes back a bit to the point that Mark was making as well about plans don't need to be set in stone. We need to be agile. We need to be able to react um, and and be, you know, our t- take our teams with us on that journey as well, don't we? Yeah, so often uh, when, when it comes to change as, as a leader, the organization is doing a change to us. Maybe they're changing a benefit or they're changing the location or they're changing the return to work policy. And so we as a leader are expected to implement that. Um, Conversely, we have um, changes that within our work group, we are deciding to make as well. Maybe we'll do a process change or there's some sort of policy change around the way that we do our work. And so uh, what I invite the reader in this particular chapter to do is to think about change from a very deliberate perspective. What is the vision for the change? What's intended to get better or to get less of or whatever the change reason uh, is? And then do a very deliberate analysis about how are people going to be impacted? What is going to change and what is not going to change? I think as leaders, we often forget to describe what is not going to be changed. You know, your compensation isn't going to change. We're still going to come to work every day. We're still going to make widgets every day. All those kind of things that help ground people in, oh, my goodness, this isn't as enormous of a change as I thought. And then finally, how do we get people from here to there? Uh, what kind of training is going to happen? When can they ask questions? What happens if they can't learn how to do the new process or, or implement the new solution? What happens to them then? And know that people move through a change process at different rates. Some of us will react to, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this change for the for the last three years. I can't wait to get started to some of us will respond oh we tried this four years ago it didn't work then i'm just going to stick with the status quo and um they'll give up on it just like they did last time so i think as a leader (laughs) our challenge is that lots of people respond in different ways as we've been talking about and we need to bring them all along from where their perspective is and again, it comes back to understanding the ind- individuals, doesn't it? And their motivations and their fears probably as well. Um, and and you can only do that if you've had that one-to-one time with them to really understand how they might react to something, um, anticipate it. And I think what you said there about what's not going to change is so important because the foundations are still there. Um, you know, we're not changing everything at once. Don't panic. But managing that fear and expectation as much as anything and speculation is massive isn't it when 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 change is announced as well so it's about managing that and being clear what it does mean so that people don't go off on a complete tangent which we often see i think <laughs> exactly what, what I could think... possibly happen catastrophize everything <laughs> well exactly and i think giving um, your employees a chance to um to just plain ask those questions I remember I'm hearkening way back many, many, many years ago when my daughter was going into kindergarten. The f- couple of days before she started kindergarten, she was just not herself. She she was just, she was a pretty easygoing kid, but she wasn't herself. And finally, we sat down and I said, what are you worried about, about kindergarten? And we literally went through this list and I said, well, are you worried about this? Are you worried about where to go to the bathroom? Yeah, I am. (laughs) And so we talked through scenarios. Well, what, you know, if you have to go to the bathroom and it's not time, what do you do? Oh, you raise your hand and ask the teacher. Yeah, she'll be happy to tell you where to go, you know. And we just worked through all of these weird questions that as a grown up, I didn't have, but as a (laughs) five-year-old, they were pretty serious. And I think as leaders, Leaders, we're worried that people will ask questions that we don't have an answer to, mm-hmm. or they're going to say something about the change that we just don't like. And I encourage leaders to at least get those things voiced because they're still thinking them. Mm-hmm. Whether they've brought them up or not doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they haven't surfaced. And so often mm-hmm. when I've worked on change efforts, People ask these questions and I say to myself, gosh, I hadn't thought about that. 
we haven't really thought through that one. We'll put that on the list and we'll work through it. Yeah. It's so much better to know what people are worried about than just over overlook it and not let it be voiced. Mm. I think that's mm. really true. The worries don't go away just yeah. because we don't give them the opportunity to express them, do they? And and mm-hmm. yeah, as leaders, there can be a fear of what people are going to ask. What if I don't answer it the right way or I don't have the answers at this time? But that's when it then comes back to we don't always have to have the answers. Like you say, it might be something we haven't thought about. It could be a really great point or it could be something that we need to go out and f- away and find out about and come back. Um, but mm-hmm. it's it's about having that maturity and that confidence to say, I don't know, but I'll find out or, you know, great question. Let's see. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think th- there's definitely a thing there about how we're, we're worried we might not have the right answer and derail whatever the change mm-hmm. is and, and make it worse. But it's about having that confidence, isn't it, and developing that so that you can anticipate and deal with those questions. Becky, you're right. It's about developing that confidence that I don't have to have all the answers. Yeah. But as a leader, I do need to ask the question. I need to find out what people are thinking so then I can deal with them. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. Um, Because if you don't know, like, well, as we said, the worries don't go away and you've just got a dissatisfied team that are anxious and and aren't going to be performing and aren't going to be happy in what they're doing. So um, really important to give them the opportunity, certainly. Yeah. And and this is kind of this is very much about growing into yourself as a leader, isn't it? You know, it's Mm -hmm. it's perhaps when you're a young leader, you don't want to show weakness. You're worried that it will undermine your position. But Mm -hmm. as you get when when you're when you're the same age as me and Becky, um, then you start to realise that, you know what, showing a bit of you know, humility, showing your softer underbelly, being being prepared to say, hey, I don't know, you know, I, I think I think that you become more relatable as a leader, but you don't realise that when you're younger, you think it's all about strength. And, and maybe that's culture as well. Maybe, maybe there's a, you know, a cultural element, you know, being kids of the 70s, which we were, you know, it's, it's it was still very much the masculine dominated world at that point. M- maybe things are starting to slowly move for the better where, you know, it's okay not to have to kind of puff your chest out and act all macho about everything it's just not the way the world is designed to be and and it's okay to not be like in fact it's good to not be like that maybe culturally we're changing or maybe it's because I'm getting older I don't know which one it is um perhaps a bit of both so uh so Janet talking about maybe uh sort of like when we're younger and how we change um that leads us into one of our stock questions at the end of uh, each podcast guest that we have and and that is if you could transport yourself back in time to an 18 year old Janet what three pearls of wisdom or pieces of advice would you try and impart on yourself? Hmm. I think first I would say everything's going to be okay. You turned out just fine. (laughs) I wish I could have worried less, cried less, had, had doubts less uh, because it's, it was a good journey. Uh, My children are grown. They're really lovely people. um, And uh, it, it, it was really it was, it was good. Um, I think the second one is as a woman leader, have more confidence in yourself. Uh, again, I got to be in the Marine Corps at a time of tremendous change for women leaders. And I think it was because there were those women that were just w- willing to do their job really, really well. And um, so maybe don't hold back uh, as much just because you're worried about what people may say or what may they may think because you've really got some great ideas i'm not sure what the third one is mark i think maybe i'll hold on those two the third one could be if you're ever on a podcast and someone asks you for three questions tell them at the start you're only going to do two (laughs) there we go right 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 I think two is more than enough. <laughs> okay. be- be- qu- qu- quality is better. Quality is better than quantity. All so well. yeah, they were two go. really good ones. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, there's a good one. No, it's great, and I can really relate to both of those, Janet. I mean, um, it's going to be okay. It's just such a such a valuable one, isn't mm-hmm. it? So if we only knew that at an earlier age, um, whatever life throws at us, it will be okay. Now I am going to ask for a number here. Um, so our other stock question is: Which three books, podcasts, uh, YouTube clips, etc., would you recommend that our listeners take a look at? Aha! Uh-huh. Um, 
I would, uh, you know, make sure that you add something casual to your list. Um, I always go back to Jane Austen. I just think she has such amazing pearls of wisdom, whether you watch a movie or, or read one of her books. Of um, And I always appreciate that we're not in Jane Austen times, even though I love to go back. I think a podcast and anything from Adam Grant I think Adam Grant, you know, he's at the Wharton School in Philadelphia. He um, writes, he's so well researched. And so even before I teach a class, I, I go back to some of his stuff and say, so what do we really know? Uh, what does the research say about um, these concepts around human behavior and behavior at work? And so I, I go to back to that again and again. Um, the third one is to make sure I think... Anything that's, that's contemporary, that's fiction right now, I think it gets us to a different space and time. Becky, I think what we were saying a minute ago is everything's going to be okay. Um, if we spend at least some time in, in fiction literature, it gives us a sense about, boy, our life is going pretty darn well. And I think finding ways to be really grateful about um, here's what's going well. And, you know, I could be like that guy in the book. I think that helps. That's great. That's a really yeah, that's, different that's a great um, one. Yeah. way to look at it as well. Often when we ask this question, Janet, you know, we, we get great ideas about leadership books, personal development books, things like that. But I love the fact that you're saying, you know, read some fiction to just expose yourself to what other, you know, what life could be like or um, other experiences. And that's so valuable, isn't it? And as much as having that downtime mm. as well. Mm. And I can really relate to that. Joe. I've literally just finished reading the uh, the A.G. Riddle the, uh, the Atlantis trilogy, which he wrote in 2013, 14 and 15, I think. And I suddenly realized, hey, the world's a pretty good, even despite some of the geopolitical issues going on at the moment, it's a much better world than it turned out in those books. I'm thinking, yeah. So so that is such a relevant point to having yeah. just read those books and finished the third one yesterday. I just finished reading Olga Dies Dreaming, which um, the New York Times had recommended. And it's all about Puerto Rico. And, you know, being here in the United States, we kind of don't, you know, we've got this strange relationship with Puerto Rico and um, they generally get the short end of the stick over and over and over again. And it's, you know, reading gives us, brings into our conscious um, things that we really should be aware of, but don't necessarily uh, spend time on because of our lives are busy. And so it was a good refresher for me. Well, Janet, that, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a really, really interesting and engaging conversation. Thank you. And we would definitely recommend that the the listeners please take a look at Janet's book. We've we've covered we've covered the key headline points, but we've got nowhere near all of the detail and the examples, which I know people would really benefit from if they took a read of the book. So, you know, I'm sure it's you know, click on Amazon wherever you buy your books from, local bookshops if you want to support those, you know just buy the book it's a great read and it's a great little reference guide as anyone on a leadership journey so so i'd highly recommend it so thank you for that janet really glad we, we met and had a chance to look at the book as well if people want to reach out to you um where's the best place to reach you uh janet at in the lead i n t h e l e a d dot c o c o not com dot co i would be happy to you know spend time with you even on a free coaching call to figure out you know where are you struggling as a leader how do you get more effective um there are are many paths to being a, a really solid leader and i'd be happy to engage with anybody in figuring out what is the next step to their effectiveness thank you that, that's really generous thank you and and i know you're very active on linkedin as well because i'm i'm linked in with you janet so i see the mm -hmm. posts you put up there so i think if people want to get a flavor of what you're doing then you know take a look at janet on linkedin as well thank you so much thank you becky and mark have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Well, Becky, it was great to have Janet on the show and take a dive into her book. Great point in the book. I really did enjoy it. You know, it kind of it, it made me challenge myself and think about myself. And I, and I know it will for people who read the book and also for the listeners who listen to today's podcast. But in traditional fashion, let's just try and pick out you know, three nuggets which Janet left us with, which really resonated with us. So so over to you for the first one. Yeah. So the first really big one for me was was about the um, so it's point two, isn't it? No plan is no will mean no execution because the team need that vision. They need to understand 
the language we've always used previously is what's the why. Um, but going forward, we're going to be saying in order to, um, because I, I agree with you. I think that's really, you know, engaging and really motivating as well um, to help people move forwards as opposed to um, just being told what to do. Yeah, why, why? It's funny, so, someone one, years ago, someone told me that because it apparently the five whys when we get to the root cause of something using that that method, that came out of the Toyota production system. And yeah. the person I was speaking to said that culturally um, in Japan, it, it was it was culturally accepted to ask why, where in the Western world, particularly the UK, why has got those more negative connotations, like you're being challenged or it's aggressive. And and as Janet was talking, it really that that came back into my head, and I was thinking, yeah, in you know, in order to, I just like that language. So yeah, I'm with yeah. you 100 percent on that one, Becky. I do like that. We're definitely going to use that one. Um, so this, so, so the one for me. So point number two. Um, I, I think it, it was under the the do it differently, you know, be creative, make things more fun. And Janet was giving the example of when she runs workshops and how she rather than saying, OK, we need to hit X, Y and Z target. How do we do it? The make it how do we make it worse? I thought I love mm. that one because it makes it fun. People are not trying to think of the answers then. It's quite easy to think, yeah, we know how to make this worse. And then the polar opposite of that is probably what's going to make it better. So yeah. I thought that was a great technique and I'm definitely going to use that one um, when we're trying to problem solve in, in, in my team from now on in. I think, yeah, what could make it worse? I can just see that's going to be good fun as well, but with a really yeah. productive endpoint to it. Yeah, it kind of feels like it would take your brain to a different place and then you can be refreshed in terms of thinking what, what will be better. So yeah, I really yeah. like that one too. We could have a lot of fun with that. I think so, definitely. And then, so the third point that I really took away from that, her third point in the book, which is if not developing your team. So such a massive mistake for a, for a manager leader. One way to do that and such a valuable way is those one-to-ones. And it comes down to the quality of the questions that you ask and then listening. And I think when she said, you know, about, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but about a third of the time should be you doing the talking compared to the two thirds being the the other person and you actually listening to them. I think that was really powerful. And if we could, if we could apply that in practice more, I think we would really see benefits. Um, just mm. understanding our people and asking them about themselves and what makes them tick. So that was, that was a really good one for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you know, that, that kind of linked into that feedback point as well, didn't it? You know, mm. if we have one-to-ones, we can give proper constructive feedback. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think we should have more, we should have more general conversation. And this doesn't mean big formal meetings. It just means more one-to-one -one time with individuals yeah. in the team as well. Definitely. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Becky. So so just to recap, the three points that we really took out of this, lots of points we took out of it, but the three that we really kind of resonated with, I suppose. Um, the first one was the in order to, you know, that enabling question rather than the sort of the why, the, the what is the team's purpose? How do we get to it in order to? And it just leads on to the next thing. We, we really like that. The second one was um, in brainstorming and problem solving, how do we make it worse? You know, let's take a step back. Let's make it fun to go forwards again. And Becky, as you were just saying, the third one was um, around developing teams and having really good quality one to ones and really remembering that the listening is so important. Um, the two ears, one mouth principle, um, as we like wow. to call it as well. <laughs> so thank you for listening to today's show. Hopefully you got some value out of it. In the show notes, there's going to be links to how you can reach out to Janet. And Janet kindly said that she would be happy to have some one-to-one -one conversations. So you know, please take advantage of that in the nicest possible way. Reach out to Janet. We'll also put a link in to the book um, so you can order your own copy and take a read of it and dive into that yourselves. So that just leads to say thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show on your on the platform of your choice, Apple, Spotify, please like us five stars if you can and review us. It really helps other people find the show. And finally, a massive thank you to our sponsors, Larkin Gowan. Without Larkin Gowan, this show wouldn't be possible. So take a look at their website to see how their team of experts can help you and your business. So for me and Becky, that just leaves us to say, have a great week, everybody. Be kind to yourself and boost your health, wealth and self.